Chris, introduce yourself. Sure. Um, Chris Kikoris. I'm the CEO of U Financial Group here in Mechanicsburg, Pennsylvania. Nice. And uh, how did U Financial get tied in with Cherapy? Uh, again, great question. I, I think, uh, you know, it was, it was organic in my eyes, right? It was the fact that I had been a client and friend of your state and, uh, you know, that relationship grew and blossomed. And, you know, I think one morning uh, before work, I was in here and you shared the vision of what, you know, Cherapy was all about. Right. And uh, I think the alignment was spot on with um, a lot of the things that we hold dear, you know, service and support of the community and uh, an appreciation for those that have served. That, that's true. Uh, Cherapy and you financial our, our goals and values align seamlessly, mm -hmm. seamlessly. Uh, what kind of services does uh, your financial offer? You know, kind of everything. Everything across the board from uh, super complicated um, uh, employee retention or, or retirement planning and, and estate planning to uh, pretty simply helping young folks and new families save for retirement and college and protect themselves if something goes wrong. That's nice. Yeah. That's, that's, that's a lot of good services to yeah. offer. Yeah, so kind of over the board. How can, how can people find you? Pretty easily. We're on uh, Instagram, Facebook. Um, we just unleashed a new website. It's pretty cool. Uh, Ufinantialgroup.com. Okay. Pretty easy to find. But, um, yeah, pr pretty locatable. Google's powerful, powerful being. You it know? is. It is. Yeah. Perfect. It, well, it's, it's great working with you. And Absolutely. We're excited to bring out these episodes. Awesome. I am love. So what got you into law enforcement? I took a summer job with an IBM company, it was subcontracted, and I sat in a cubicle for eight hours straight. Um, you could get up and walk around if you needed a break, but it was just, you're in a tiny cubicle, punching away at a computer, so that's when I decided that I didn't want to do something like that. Huh. And when I graduated college, I took a job with the Dolphin County Sheriff's Office, kind of as my big first big boy job. <laughs> and, <laughs> big boy job. Yeah, and that's how it started. You said you've, like, you've been on the job for 10 years now? Yeah, in December we'll make 10 years. So, 10 years ago when you got on the job versus 10 years today, what do you think's changed the most in policing or in, you know, in your day to day job? It's still the same. Same job to me. Okay. There's challenges every single day. We don't have the the public trust like we used to. Have I ever called the police? No. I think the police are inherently prejudiced. I've never met a bad cop. They are not good people. <laughs> we talked about in the past is with uh, regards to training. How do you train new officers uh, to deal with potential uh, clients that? may have been taught from a very young age uh, not to trust law enforcement or don't like law enforcement. How do you get somebody ready in the academy or when they're on the street to deal with that? So it's, that's a tough question. Um, I don't know that I have the exact answer. You're always going to have people that don't trust the police. There could have been um, some kind of a negative interaction with police that that has forced somebody to not trust the police or they could have been taught not to. 
Um, you're always going to have that to deal with on the job. Um, but the best thing I can give, you know, a new police officer, best advice I can give a new police officer is do your job professionally. Every single time you deal with the public, treat everybody the same way, equally, unbiased, and conduct yourself professionally. Uh, your actions speak louder than anything else, and the more and more you continue to do your job to the best of your ability with professionalism, people are going to start to, they might not trust you right away, but they might feel more comfortable talking to you or speaking to you. Um, and the other thing I would say is get out and talk to people. Talk to the, the area that you're serving. Talk to the public. You're not going to know the things that they're dealing with or their struggles or their issues with police unless you talk to them. Is that kind of how you conduct yourself in your day-to-day -day business? You get out, use dialogue more than uh, any other te techniques or tactics? I'll talk to anybody. It, it, that's, a, that's a big part of the job that some people have trouble grasping right away, but you got to talk to people. But the one thing that you've said before is, uh, be your, as a field training officer yourself, mm -hmm. one of the things that you tell new police when they come on is, you don't care how many gizmos and gadgets you have on your belt. Your mouth is your weapon. Your mouth is your biggest weapon. Yep. Right? And, you know, that, that has stuck with me. I, I really appreciate that, that saying. Well, and that's, you know, a lot of people know that inside the law enforcement community, but... And your mouth is your biggest tool. I won't even see, say weapon. Your mouth is your biggest tool. We find that if you, temp, you take the time and attempt to de-escalate, there's less uses of force that are necessary. If you can talk to people, you can talk them right in the handcuff. Um, if you talk to people, they, you have an, a level of respect between one another, okay? Mm -hmm. I'm taking the time to actually listen to what you're saying if we have a conversation. So I think that goes a long way. I mean, you're not just showing up as a police officer, do what I say, um, you have to listen to me. No, it, I, there's already people who off the bat, when you show up just because you're in uniform, you're the bad guy right off the bat. Absolutely. And I don't want it to be that way, but I understand that that's how it's going to be sometimes. Mm -hmm. But I would tell people that, you know, Having a conversation and actively listening to somebody else, not just waiting your turn to speak, is is a good way to engage the public and, you know, in a way, start to rebuild their trust. We have city councils across the country looking to defund their police department. Well, one of our things we talked about was we wanted to talk about the current environment of law enforcement across the country right now. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think the biggest, the, one of the biggest movements is the defund the police movement. How do you mm -hmm. defund or dismantle and keep people safe? When we all dial 911, we need to know there's somebody coming. You defund the police or diminish their ability to police their communities, you're going to have a war zone. What would defund the police mean to your department at High Spire versus a nationwide defund the police? Mm -hmm. If you could elaborate on that a little bit. So the idea to defund the police, the way I understand what most people would like to see happening is reallocating funds mm -hmm. from the police to different social organizations. Um, putting more funds in those social organizations I agree with wholeheartedly. But I will say that taking them from the police is not the best idea. Um, if you take a look at different departments, not even just my department, but Generally, like on a national level, most police departments, their budget is low to begin with. Okay. They're working minimum, uh, they have minimum manpower. Um, they don't have as much access to resources like training budgets or training opportunities, which... So they really count on that money. Police desperately need to be trained. Um, oh, yeah. And it's, you don't just... That's kind of that double-edged sword where they want, you want police to be well-trained, but if you defund their budget, yeah. How do you train them? Exactly. And that's, unfortunately, that's one of the first areas to get cut. Training. When you're talking about, yeah, okay. when you're talking about budget cuts or reallocating funds. Um, and public safety as a whole, for the most part, is a system. You have, obviously our side is the police, then you have 
fire, you know, mm -hmm. the EMS, but you also have these social organizations and uh, social programs through either the county or the municipality that you're working for, or even the state that they need funding too. So one of the other things that we had talked about um, as far as the whole defund the police movement, which I honestly had not even considered thinking about until you brought it up, was if you cut a, a department's staffing in half or you got rid of them altogether, response times. So when you're talking about a small place like High Spire, uh, what would that mean as far as response times? Who, who would be coming to cover if there was no police in High Spire? Oh, it, it, it all depends. Um, so I, I think it's important to, to note that some people think that defund the police means to get rid of the police. I mean, just, that's not that's not possible. Mm -hmm. You're going to have to have police. So somebody's going to have to somebody's going to have to step up. Say that the police are gone in High Spire. Somebody's going to have to patrol that, and usually that would fall to the Pennsylvania State Police, if no other jurisdiction, you know, decides or or they're contracted to cover the High Spire Borough. Um, it would fall to the state police at that point, but you still have to pay for it. So there's still there's always got to be police. Yeah, is what you're saying. And it, it's not just as simple of well defund the police and get rid of them. No, somebody has to be there to to answer calls and um, to serve. So at some point you're going to be paying for it. So if you if you want to contract police services elsewhere. Your response times increases. Like your response time increases, um, you won't have as much coverage. Uh, you won't have potentially. You might not have a police officer in that jurisdiction for 24 hours. You hmm. might not have full coverage. So there's a lot more that you need to consider before just saying, "Oh, just take funds away from the police." See, that's not something I never would have even thought about. I I don't disagree that we need more funding in different organizations. I think that's a great idea. Mm -hmm. But to take it away from the police, I don't know if it's feasible. Over over your last 10 years in law enforcement, I'm sure you've seen some incredible highs and lows. Uh, if you're open to it, if you'd like to share um, a couple stories, maybe something that's been a life-changing moment uh, as a high uh, in law enforcement for you. There's a lot of things that shape who you are, and not only as a person, but as your you know, career in law enforcement. Um, one of the most notable, it happened recently, and it was in late when, you know, there was just that, there was a huge divide between police. I mean, there still is, but um, it was just really bad in the media and things weren't good. Um, so I got called to a domestic between a mother and daughter. And I didn't know what it was, but, um, Another jurisdiction actually had the daughter, um, they picked up the daughter just to separate the mother and the daughter because it was just a really bad situation. Mm -hmm. So as soon as I got there, I started talking to her and she was just, she didn't like me. I don't, I try to approach every situation the same way, um, professionally and, and courteous, but um, she just did not like me. And at one point she said, no wonder the general public, I mean, I'm paraphrasing here, but no wonder the general public hates police because you all are the same. I've been stopped and searched on a number of occasions growing up and whether I like it or not, it has um, given me a bitter taste of the police. As soon as I became a licensed driver, the police were a terrifying force in my life. Even if you, you do nothing wrong, you are constantly anticipating that you'll be pulled over. It, it happens, it's yeah. the reality of it. Um, I don't take it personally. Um, they see me as a uniform, as a police officer. They don't know if they saw probably you, even my first name. If they saw you somewhere and you didn't have a uniform on, they wouldn't even blink an eye. Uh, it's, it's possible. <laughs> it's it's very possible. Yeah. It's, it's just perception. So she was angry with me. And the way the story, or not story, but the way the, um, the interaction just progressed, um, there were some issues between mom and daughter. And she was still, she's still minor, um, so I had to contact mom. Well, it turned out that mom was just fed up with her, and we, I, I didn't know what to do. So I called Children and Youth. I said, hey, I need help on this one. 
I said, I don't really have any crimes here. I said, but there is definitely issues between mom and daughter. Um, can we set up a time to meet? I have daughter with me. Um, and she said, yeah, I'll, I'll call mom and we'll meet at the station there to try to discuss things. So she's just does not, still does not like me. She's in the back of my car. You know, I notified dispatch, hey, you know, I, I got a juvenile female. I'm taking her back to the station, you know, to meet with children and youth. Mm -hmm. So we couldn't meet for an hour. And, you know, we were at the station and I offered her a glass of water. You know, I said, are you hungry? Do you need something to eat? So I did something different there that I probably wouldn't have done. I just listened to her. We had a conversation and I didn't do much talking. Mm -hmm. And, you know, in the police realm or law enforcement, usually you have to do a lot of the talking. You have to, you know, tell people what you expect or you need to do this or... You know, you're interviewing somebody, but at this point, I, I just let her talk. Mm -hmm. So we spoke for about an hour, and you know, it was sad. It was really sad. She was because, surprised about everything she talked about. Well, she told me that, you know, she had problems with her mom before. Um, she essentially kicked her out, and she was living, not in a foster care system, but she was living with a guardian that took her in, you know, to provide a safe place, which was a great move on her part, but. Then she later revealed to me that she's gay mm -hmm. and she has a girlfriend. But the foster parent didn't agree with that because of their beliefs. Okay. And so she didn't really feel welcome there. And essentially, from what I gathered, mom was didn't want her just because she viewed her as a burden. So I felt, I felt really sad for her because she really didn't have anywhere else to go. And the only place she wanted to go was to her girlfriend's house where she... That's where she felt loved and accepted. Mm -hmm. And I couldn't blame her. We talked about all kinds of stuff where she, you know, what she wanted to do when she graduated from school. Um, what she likes to do, like just who she was as a person. And mm -hmm. I listened. And that made a huge difference, not only with me, but I think with her. So long story short, mom came to our department and we had a meeting out, outside because of COVID. And mom was being unreasonable. Essentially, she said she didn't want her daughter anymore. And that's really where it was, it hit home that's, for me that this, she had nowhere to go. That's painful. It's really painful. And mom started screaming at, you know, the worker from Children and Youth. And she started screaming at me that she didn't want her daughter. And finally, I looked at her and I was like, I'm sorry that you have to go through this. And she apologized to me. Mm -hmm. The kid apologized so the to me. So the narrative completely flipped where she didn't like you in the and she, Yeah, and she said, I'm sorry about this, Officer McMillan. And I said, there is nothing you have to be sorry for. The thing that I it, it really, really bothered me the most was that she had nowhere to... She's a child. Mm -hmm. She had nowhere to go. She had nobody that she could count on. But the one thing that I was glad for was that she might not like all police officers and she might still have her own opinions... But at least when she says, talks about me, she'll say, she might say, I'm not saying she will, but she might say, I actually had a positive experience with him. And that's, to me, I, I kind of changed philosophies at that point. You know, it's not about, you know, getting people to trust the police. Mm -hmm. that, that's not the main goal. It's getting to a point where you treat every situation the same way. Okay. Mm -hmm. You want, obviously want people to trust you, but there's no magic answer. You just got to listen to people. Yeah. Talk to them. And it goes back full circle to what we were just talking about, how just having a conversation, listening, mm -hmm. talking can go a lot further than any other form of, uh, I don't know how you want to phrase it. And it, you know, you say like, what's the one instance or the one situation that changed your life? I've been doing this for 10 years. Every day there's a struggle. Mm -hmm. Every day you have to do something or you you find out something that is not great or you have a situation that you have to deal with that is, you know, it's really hard. Mm -hmm. um, some are worse than others, but there's also days where things are great. You know, you impact somebody's life on a positive level. Um, you know, they thank you for doing something, you know, for you doing your job. And that's, that's the reality of it. That's a good um, feeling. Yeah. yeah. I imagine it's a thankless job. Most Sometimes. Of the time. 
I, I won't say that it's a completely thankless job and be cynical about it. There are people that appreciate us. Yeah. Um, you know, we're just at a point right now where the the nation is divided. Um, I the only thing I can say to that is we've got to communicate. We've got to talk to each other. Um, everybody has their own opinions. Yeah. And nobody's opinion is more valuable than the next. In regards to community policing, do you think it would be advantageous if you had more locals from, like, the, the small towns step up to do policing, not just in High Spire, but like L.A. or Pittsburgh or anywhere, just because they know the community, they know the people in the community, would they be better suited officers? I, I mean, I, I don't... I don't know that that's ever a bad idea. Okay. I think every police department strives to, you know, they would love for members of their community to be police officers, to, you know, to join the department. It offers a lot more, you know, especially towards the community aspect of it. Um, if, I, if I'm training somebody and I don't know the area, or if I'm a police officer and I don't really know the area, mm -hmm. it's going to be difficult for me, you know, when I first start, it's going to take me a while to get acclimated to that culture, that community, you know, what's going on. But um, if you have somebody there that is a member of the community, they can help out other officers. They can tell them, you know, different things. They can present different ideas. Um, they're just a wealth of knowledge in that community. Um, it, it's definitely an advantage. The problem that we have nowadays is, you know, there's kind of there's a disconnect. Um, a lot of people don't want to be police officers. They don't trust the institution. They don't trust the department. Um, they don't really think that we stand for what we should. Mm -hmm. um, and, and you see that a lot in the urban areas as well. I, I think it would be extremely beneficial for uh, members of the community that have a vested interest to join their police department. Uh, it, you can say so many things about how it would increase um, relations between the public and the police. Mm -hmm. Put the ticket books away. Don't look to make an arrest as your first, as the first tool that you're pulling out of, out of your, your, your toolbox. When our recruits graduate the academy, they're immediately put on a footbeat and introduced to the community. They, all they do is knock on doors and introduce themselves. For instance, we have, a, we have an officer that speaks, well, he's Hispanic, so he speaks Spanish. Um, I can't tell you how many times we ha have an interaction with somebody who cannot speak English. They only speak Spanish. Um, they might be a little standoffish, they might be a little irritated, but as soon as I call that officer to assist me, then, you know, it, 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 it helps the situation first and foremost because we can talk to them and then we can relay, hey, we're not, we're not trying to hurt you, we're not trying to make things worse, we're just trying to help you. So you know, that's just a, an, an example of how having somebody that can communicate and relate to the community that you're dealing with or you're serving, um, it just it makes for a better police officer and a better police department. How do you get those locals to, come out, to want to come out to, to better their community? That's, that's I, don't know, I don't know if I have the answer. I don't know if anybody has the answer to that. Um, be the change. <laughs> be the change. I, I like that. That's, I, I don't. That's that's truthful. Yeah, I I, I got into change, be change. Yeah, I got into law enforcement because I felt drawn to to serve the community and something bigger than myself. Um, I think if you want to see change, you're going to have to be willing to change, or to help anyway. When you're getting ready for shift, uh, what kind of mindset do you have to get yourself into? Because, you know, at any given time, you might have to arrest somebody's parent in front of them. You might have somebody, you know, try to take your life. You know, I know it's not the thing you think about, or you don't try not to think about it, but, you know, you might have to pull your gun in in the course of your duty. How do you, how do you prepare yourself mentally before your shift for that? And what kind of mindset do you get in? Because obviously you don't you don't put on your uniform with going, well, I hope I can arrest someone today. Nobody does. Well, I mean, it's an awareness. You have to be aware. Um, 
you have to know that through the course of your duties, you may have to arrest somebody. It's likely that you will arrest somebody. Um, mm. God forbid you have to use force on somebody. I'm not talking about deadly force. Any I'm talking about any kind of force. I don't know a single police officer that wants to use force. Are there some out there? Maybe. But I, the police officers that I know would like to avoid that at all costs. I don't know a single police officer that says, hey, I want to hurt somebody. We, we don't want to do that. Um, as far as you know, the getting ready for a threat or danger, um, I'm prepared to protect myself and protect the public. Mm -hmm. um, I usually say a prayer before my shift um, for protection and um, just to help me do my job as best I can. Um, and I literally hope and pray for the best each shift. Um, like I said, it's more so an awareness. Um, there is a mindset, I, I guess you could call it a mindset, but you have to be aware of what's going on um, about your safety, about everybody's safety. Um, and it's not something that you can turn off. Okay. Um, it's got to be there all the time. Mm -hmm. It's tough to turn off, especially when you go home. Yeah, I mean, how do you, how do you, how do you turn it off when you leave? It, it doesn't happen. It does. It, it unfortunately, you know, when you're at home, you'd like it to go away, but it, it doesn't. And there's inherent risk and inherent danger in our line of work. We just try to mitigate it as much as possible and hope that it doesn't happen. But be ready for if it does. I can, I can appreciate that. Is there is there anything that you want to add to to everything that we talked about, you know, either in your your line of work or just regarding the current environment as a whole, and regarding law enforcement and the society right now? Um, I mean, I realize I'm not going to change everybody's opinion. Uh, that's just it's just not going to happen. Yeah. But I think that. The message that I want to get across is that we are human just like everybody else is. Um, on a whole, we try to do the best we can. We try to conduct ourselves professionally. Sometimes that doesn't happen with certain police officers. We try to do the best we can, treat everybody equally. I would love it if there, were, there was no more conflict, if there was no more issues between the public and the police. Mm -hmm. um, and I think the best way to approach that is we got we're gonna have to have some conversations. Circles it back around. Uh, Everything goes back around in conversation. We're just we have to talk and we have to get we have to actively listen as well. Mm -hmm. um, that's how we start. I don't have answers. I don't know too many people that have the exact answers, but we've got to start somewhere because this can't continue. I mean, the police are going to be needed. Um, but the public has to trust them. Yeah. So the best I can say is we need to start talking. We need to figure some things out. We're at a point where we need definitely need to make some changes to society and law enforcement. Mm -hmm. I don't necessarily know what those are, but we need to bring back communication between the community and the police. Um, we would like to see more people involved on our side. Um, you know, start having these conversations, start talking about what the issues really are. And there's plenty of people that have opinions and they think that they have the answers, but quite frankly, we need to talk about it. There needs to be open lines of communication between all forms of the community, all levels of the community. Um, and we need to open up as a police, as a law enforcement community and say, hey, what could we do better? Um, how can we uh, assist in this transition because where we are right now it's very tense it's we're, this, po we're, we're polarized pivotal, yeah this pivotal point right now um so i would say that we need to get more people involved on both sides um and actively listen to each other and i think that's there's a big communication breakdown right now especially um between both sides, the community and law enforcement. And if we don't mend that, 
then it's just going to get more and more difficult. And like I said, I try to do the best I can. Um, I'm trying to do my job to the best of my abilities. And I think that's where most police officers are. Um, sometimes it's not portrayed that way. Sometimes it's super negative just because I don't know if it, if the media that's what sells. Um, but there's a lot of police officers doing good things. And on the other side of it, there's a lot of community members that are doing good things. There are a lot of people that are doing good things for the community and want change for the right reasons. Mm -hmm. And we ought to focus on those people more, the ones that are doing things for their community. Just like we should probably focus on law enforcement that are doing good things. Good police. Yes. Good policing. Yeah, I like that. The good blue. The good blue. That's right.